Attention viewers, are you eager to start building your credit yet have no idea where to start? Do you want a credit company that cares about your financial health as much as you do? Look no further than Pedal, the sponsor of today's video. Behold the Pedal One card. It's slight and unobtrusive appearance. It's as fashionable as it is efficient. Pedal One is partnered with WebBank member FDIC who issues the card. In addition to your credit score, Pedal uses your banking info when you apply to create a cash score. And if your credit worthiness is good based on your spending and savings, you could be able to qualify for a better card. When you're on the town, Pedal doesn't want you to be locked into debt. It has no annual fee. And with credit limits between $500 to $5,000, it's a great way to start building your credit. Pedal has partnered with gobs of national brands and small businesses to give you 2 to 10% cash back on your transactions. You can even analyze your spending on their easy-to-use mobile app. You can check to see if you qualify without affecting your credit score, and it only takes a few minutes to do. Start building your credit history. Go to pedalcard.com slash utree today to find out more. That's P-E-T-A-L, like the flower. And it can help you start building a credit score. Once again, thank them for sponsoring this video. Now on to the presentation. It's been a fascinating year for hockey. I still wish fans were allowed in, but they're slowly being brought back into the fold. For obvious reasons, it's at limited capacity, but a very positive sign nonetheless. A good chunk of franchises in the East Division have had some semblance of fan representation off the ice. But how are they doing on it? It's been a struggle for Beantown this season. Despite everything that should signify an uptrend, starting the year 10-1-2 looking like legit world beaters. The usual suspects are doing their thing. The core is strong. Team defense, particularly the penalty kill, has been suffocating. In a normal world, the Bruins would be near the top of their division thinking bigger than hoping to make the playoffs. Stagnation is quite the bitch, isn't it? Losing 9 of 13 is a slap back to reality. COVID outbreaks and team issues have not been kind. It's been rough sledding. So why the sudden skepticism on them? The problem with Boston has been the same damn thing they've been dealing with for the past five or so years. They have no depth scoring. Trying to force goals out of their non-core players is like squeezing blood out of a boulder. There's just nothing there. Little of what they've done to try and fix it has worked. Without the big guns scoring, they're forced to rely on defense and goaltending to get them out of bad situations. And they've been good but not great between the pipes. Thus, you get a team stalling out like they have. I wonder when the Boston media points the finger at Tuka Rask for the depth not producing. Maybe they can even score on even strength against the Devils more than once. I feel like we have this conversation every single year about the Sabres. To call this team trash would be considered libelous to every piece of refuse on the side of the road. There's utter failure and then there is Buffalo. A team where every single move has been infested with a rot that seeps into every pull. Taylor Hall? Have him become so useless that they'll be lucky to get a second round pick for him at the deadline. Jeff Skinner? Cast him off to the fucking fourth line. If he's not healthy, scratched. Nobody can fucking finish? Too bad Jack Eichel might want out again and is injured for the foreseeable future. There is no excuse in the world for the level of pig shit we are witnessing on a game-by-game -game basis. Absolutely none. Fire all the head coaches you want. Make all the posturing you can. Shuffle the lineup like deck chairs on the SS Pagula. This ship is careening off the goddamn falls. Tying the record for most consecutive losses in NHL history? That's the biggest accomplishment this franchise has earned in years. You know what else is earned? The moniker of the New Age Cleveland Browns. A land where everything is shit and the factory of sadness produces nothing but failure. I look forward to yet another fire sale at rock bottom prices. But get the fuck out of my sight. Funny how much a year can change the outlook on things. Last year the Devils were looking like an outright disaster. The John Hines saga ended badly as everything fell astray and they were forced to rebuild a rebuild. This season, no expectations. And when those are low, a team can surprise with a thing or two. Jack Hughes has bulked up and emerged as a strong scoring option. Mackenzie Blackwood and Scott Wedgwood are rock solid in net. Miles Wood is somehow turning into a decent finisher. Are they any goods? No, not really. They're most likely going to miss the playoffs again. They can't score that much and holes remain throughout the lineup. But at least for one moment, they don't smell like putrid ass. So I'll take it easy on them. I'll sit back and watch them get beaten by much stronger opponents for the most part. Because there's now someone significantly worse than them in their division. I think we all know who that is. As long as they can get someone to overpay for Kyle Palmieri, I'll call their season successful. One thing though, can you please get Nikita Gusev shit together? That dude's too skilled to be a black hole. Oh, the challenges this team faces. 
There are moments where you'll think this team is destined for another deep playoff run they're so potent. Others, it's a frustrating cycle of offensive sputtering and goaltending lapses. Let's get to the good first and foremost. Ryan Pollock and Adam Pollock. They have been outstanding this season. Jean-Gabriel Pajot is scoring like a legit top six option, what they need him to be for that cap hit. Goaltending is still relatively strong, barring the random iffy game by Sorokin some nights. Even then, the hot and cold nature lies underneath. The power play will go from on fuego to absolute zero in a month's time. The scoring spigot will suddenly run dry and compliment. The team's medal has been tested by injury. That will have to keep going as well as Anders Lee is out for the year. Oliver Wallstrom's emergence helps a little bit, but that's a void in the locker room he can't replicate. My kingdom for some consistency. Times of turmoil are aplenty in this season of all my Rangers. A team yearning for playoff aspirations suffers through conflict and chaos alike as all eyes point towards Madison Square Garden. The cancer of Tony D'Angelo is metastasized throughout the locker room. His antics and criticism of team goaltending was the final straw. Before removing the tumor from the team, an American hero allegedly punched him in the face. God bless Chris Kreider. A Russian expat Artemi Panarin has had some troubles of his own in the old motherland. Outspoken about his disliking of Putin, his former head coach spread allegations of the bread man hitting a girl at a bar ten years ago. His family in danger, Panarin takes a leave of absence to deal with the Russian bullshit. Before Artemi returns from the absence, and his Sabanajad deals with an unprecedented slump. Team defense is still a massive issue. A fringe playoff contender clings onto dear life as the tides of war surround them on all sides. Maybe in this time, David Quinn can figure out not to remain stubborn in player deployments. Will they snap out of it? Can they manage to score goals without having to play the Flyers? The growing pains and stagnation is aplenty on this season of All My Rangers. Stay tuned for the conclusion to this thrilling saga. I remember when the Flyers fan base had some shred of optimism about their team's future. I remember the joy they felt when talking about the youth, the resurgent goaltending, or Kevin Hayes scoring out of his mind. You remember when we all thought Philadelphia would take the next step towards cup contention? Boy, we were wrong about a lot of shit. The only explanations I have for the sheer regression of the Flyers in many places are either off-ice turmoil or inept coaching. There is no way that a team with this much talent can just fall off a precipice in the span of months. What the fuck have you done with Provorov and Sanai? Why does Carter Hart look like he can't stop a beach ball most nights? Why do they make the New York Rangers look like the 80s Oilers? Explain, Flyers! This franchise needs to be taken into foster care because all I'm seeing is waste and rot. The defense is trash on top of trash and the goaltending isn't much better. The forward core is just sitting around breaking sticks because they can't overcome such a stench. Back to the drawing board, Philly. You fucked up somewhere. It'd be more than that. Fucking hell. This is a team I'm having trouble gauging. It's not because they're not any good, the decent streak of form they've been on shows they are. The problem is inconsistency. There were plenty of times throughout the year where they've been aggravating to watch. They play 5-10 to 10 minutes of elite hockey, get bailed out by the shootout, then just fainted nothing. Goaltending will go from outright horrible to stopping everything in their path. Injuries have damaged a good chunk of the forward core, including Malkin. But once again, it feels as if a spark has been lit under their asses. They're getting good production from the bottom six. They look damn good in this stretch. But my question is how long will it last? I see what they're capable of, but will it be sustained? The constant fear though is Jim Rutherford doing something completely brash and vastly overpaying for deadline acquisitions again. The Pens brass feared the same thing, and took away his trading privileges for an unnamed defense. Slighted by this insult, Hans Molman returns to his bingo night in shame. He is no longer with the team. To replace him, the scourge of Philadelphia and Ron Hextall. Can feel the Flyers fans seething as I say this. You know why? Brian Burke! The new czar of Yenzerland! Get in the Mustang, we're gonna hunt for some good old North American boys on the market! The box standard capitals regular season. Consistent winning. Ovechkin doing the thing from the divot on the ice where he sits on the power play. And the team humming along as if everything is smooth. To be honest, it seems like the Capitals are more rejuvenated from what they were last season. Probably has to do with the coaching change and altering of their tactics, but they're still doing pretty well for having such young goaltending between the pipes. For five seasons for new players, depth scoring, the veteran core hasn't lost a step. I'd say everything is perfect, but then Tom Wilson tries to kill someone and he gets himself suspended for a while. If he stops that, they'll be legitimate foes in the seven-game series. 
What's the worst that can happen? They had to deal with Todd Reardon's bullshit. It can't get much worse than it has. Just keep pace, Washington. I'll see you come playoff time. As for the Central Division, one adjective comes to mind. Top heavy. There are the haves of the division and the have-nots that can only glare in envy. Let's see what these eight teams have in store. Despite the talent on display, there were a few benchmarks that had to be checked before an emergence to the next echelon could be reached. So far, I'm most pleased to tell you that these have been passed with flying colors. They need a consistent goaltending. It has shown up so far, but from an unexpected source. Peter Morazic has been out with an injury for most of the year. So the surprise contender is a prospect thought to have stalled out in Alex Nedeljkovic. He's put up starting caliber numbers. Even more than that, honestly. The cavalry has finally arrived. And it continues in another piece of the core emerging onto the scene. Martin Nechas is becoming a bona fide star in front of our eyes. Electrifying talent and skill nearly every night to add to the likes of Ajo and Zvechnikov. The defense is revived under a healthy Dougie Hamilton, which is desperately needed. The power play, deadly. The potential I saw out of this team in the conference finals run in 2019 is starting to come into view. I merely hope they can keep it up, but they'll have a good problem on their hands. Morazic will be coming back soon, and they'll have a decision to make on that front. I'll take it over the other problem they've been having back there. Chicago seemingly can't do anything they try to do right. When they want to compete, they fall to shit thanks to an aging core. But when they see the light and wish to rebuild? Nothing insane happening, just the team bouncing back to playoff contention by mere accident. Patrick Kane and Alex Debrinkit were unhappy with the current direction and chose to carry this team on their backs. They're doing this without their two top centers. Even when they want to take a step back, they can't. You may be asking yourself what happened here. This team was supposed to be bad, right? But wait a second, what do I have in the cupboard? Oh, why, it's another random elite European that just popped out of our ass. Kevin Lankin and the new head backstop of the Black Ox. Putting in top tier production that rivals that of Corey Crawford. Can he keep it up? Who knows? But it's yet another curveball thrown into their plans. To be fair, the Black Ox have started sputtering as a place, which means that this could be the end of their fairy tale run. It might be a flash in the pan, might be sustainable, but this next month will be telling. No, Chicago, you still aren't getting rid of Stan Bowman anytime soon. Stop asking. The Blue Jackets seem to be in a state of flux. There are teams still trying to figure out their identity with a core that's constantly shuffling. There have been big moments, but never enough to truly bring them to that next tier of team. This may be John Tortorella's last chance with the group. Recent events have made it tough to think he may have life left here. It all started with Pierre-Luc Dubois, rumored to want out of Columbus the first chance he got. Well, when games began to play, he responded to adversity by spewing out one of the laziest shifts I have ever seen out of a hockey player. The dude had given up. Torts was not the answer for him. He was punished with a trade to Winnipeg. In return, Jack Roslovic, returning home with a new contract and has been solid. Also, Patrick Laine. Yes, THE Patrick Laine. The guy with the Fortnite rumors and endless trade speculations. Him with Torts hasn't gone smoothly. Early on in his tenure, he was benched for his play. I'm sorry, Torts, Patrick Laine is never going to be good in the defensive zone. It's not just them. Seth Jones has taken a few steps back. Max Domi has been ineffective. Miko Koibu fucked off after five games. Special teams has been lacking. The team as a whole is just... Ugh. They may need a fresh face behind the bench to give them a new wrinkle. And considering the NHL, it may happen sooner than we think. When you make it to a Stanley Cup or any championship round, you have to make it count. The issue is you can't expect to make it back there year after year. And what a textbook example of the post-final hangover is there than the Dallas Stars. I get it, they've had significant injuries to the core that have impacted their production. They also had that COVID outbreak before the year, but how does that explain the sudden regression to being unable to score with a damn? Pavelski and Hintz are dominating, but why the drought for Miro Heiskanen? They're a team that's only a contender when they get offense. And they are getting it. The longer this lasts, the more I feel that last year's playoff run was merely lightning in a bottle. The goaltending isn't as elite as it was last year. Their play can't carry them forever. The hope is that it's merely a slump, but there's far more evidence of this play being their standard. It's aggravating after seeing years of it. You got a new lease on life in the bubble. Don't squander the second chance because so far you are. I did say there was nowhere to go but up for the Red Wings. I never said they wouldn't stay near the bottom, however. If there's any positive to say about Detroit, it's not as bad as it was for them last season. That's about it. The problem for the Red Wings is mostly straightforward. They're having trouble scoring goals. Except when Jonathan Bernier isn't that oddly. The young core has struggled to gain traction. 
The veteran placeholders have been, well, placeholders. The Ken Holland picks aren't developing into NHL regulars. The power play has been utterly atrocious for the Wings. And signs aren't going up for them for the most part. The sort of rebuild is a long-term burn, but they're going to need a new coach for them to start making some progress. I'm more surprised by the resilience that Jeff Blaschel has shown in not getting fired. He's in a league that fires coaches for improperly breathing on a given night. At this rate, they might get some mid-round picks for a few of the veterans, but that's all they have to look forward to. Keep building. Maybe you'll get out of the muck you're in someday. If we're lucky in a few years. Would you look at that? Florida finally got its shit together. It took way too long and there were far too many wrong turns taken over the years, but the team is back on track. The decision to attract elite coaching to the group has paid off. Fluidity and versatility are the name of the games here. Team depth has skyrocketed in terms of production. Thank you, Carter for Hagee, for your sudden boom into a top six forward. Enjoy your future payday. Patrick Hoinkfist is the healthy net front presence they desperately needed. The usual suspects in Barkov and Huberto have been elite, but the key to improvement has been in net. And surprisingly, it really hasn't been Bobrovsky. It's from an unsung call-up by the name of Chris Drieger, playing like he's Prime Luongo on limited duty. The Central Division is cutthroat at the top, but the Panthers have answered the call at every occasion. I think I may be overly optimistic about them, even. So what the hell's the catch? I was expecting more of a gradual decline, not a back-breaking injury to a core member. Good fuck. I don't know if you could call this the worst-case scenario or just a return to the original expectation. We all saw how much of an utter mess they were at the beginning of the year. The terrible power play, the sluggish starts to games, and then it somehow got worse from there. The strong majority of the team ended up with long-term injuries. And suddenly things started to click for them, playing with more confidence over the past month. The power play is no longer complete garbage. Who the hell knew that allowing the youth to take on a larger role would help inject the team with life? Tolvanen, Trenin, Olivier. It just works. Some of the core snapping out of their funks helps a bit as well, but I'm still skeptical about the long-term outlook. They've been on a six-game winning streak, but the games have been against Dallas, Detroit, and a slumping Chicago. If I'm the Predators, I still try to sell off pieces at the deadline. It may seem odd, but it's the tough question they'll have to ask themselves. Can this team, in the current way it's constructed, make another deep cup run? Honestly, I think that answer is no. Considering the jobs are on the line, though, I can see some desperation moves being made at the deadline. Let's hope if they do, it doesn't damn them in the long term. Maybe more injuries to core players will fix it for them. Power. Unlimited power. This is the story of the Tampa Bay Lightning. The cup didn't make them content, it galvanized them for more. Even without Kucherov, fuck it, they have a dynasty to forge. Andre Vasilevsky is making his case for more hardware in the offseason as the big guns are ablazing and the depth keeps popping up like rabbits. The Lightning haven't skipped a beat, but as we all know, the regular season isn't the main challenge. That will come in the postseason, where they have the chance to defend their title and silence any more naysayers that think they don't have what it takes to repeat. I should know. I was one of them after that Columbus series. Yes, I will hang my head in shame. I'll put it next to the comments about Leon Dreisaitl's contract a few years ago. I think I can talk about this game. Oh my god. And Grice makes up big save. 1242 to go in the second. It wasn't much, but I wanted to get a penalty against Nashville early in the